When you're fed up with fighting food and your body, join us here. I'm Ali Shapiro, creator of the Truce With Food program and your host for Insatiable, where we explore the hidden aspects of fighting our food, our weight, and our bodies, and dive deep into nutrition science and true whole health. Fair warning, this is not your parents' health care. This is a big rebel yell to those who crave meaning, hunger for truth, and whose lust for life is truly insatiable. Believe me, freedom awaits. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Season 10, Episode 5 of Insatiable, End the Restrict Binge Cycle. So I am recording this while a couple of the episodes have already dropped. And I'm hearing from a lot of you that you're loving the insights that you're having from this season and it's really resonating. And so it's so wonderful to hear that. I love a good aha. <laughs> a lot of you said you're listening to episodes two or three times and I totally get that. And before I talk about why sometimes you have to do that, I just want everyone to know there are transcripts at my website, alishapiro.com backslash podcast. So if you're there's things you want to capture or that you're trying to remember, just know you can go and download the transcript, right? That's part of why they're there. And not everyone is an audio person. So they're also there for accessibility. But no, that's a choice that you have. And then second, realize for those of you who are listening a couple of times, this is so natural. As you get more out of the matrix, especially around weight loss, thinking it's a discipline or willpower issue, you realize everything has to be redefined. And to use a coaching term, you got to unpack, right? <laughs> a lot of things. In other words, you're in the upside down. And this work is this completely, it really reorients you, not just to food, but ourselves and the life. And um, this is why one client said, Said, instead of abbreviating truce with food, TWF, it should be WTF. <laughs> the more we get out of our own matrix, it can be like, oh my God. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in. And I love hearing your feedback and that you're sharing the podcast. That means so much to me. And if you guys could leave reviews, I also forget to mention that as well. That helps more people find the show and we can start to really change the conversation. So today, we are going to discuss how to end the binge restrict cycle. We have to address the three root causes of binging, which are deregulated blood sugar, restriction, and our story that makes us be all or nothing, with food just being one area we approach life like this, right? Restrict and binge is all or nothing. And so today we will do that by discussing how to stop restricting after a binge using the three to five rule, how to get out of the all or nothing cycle that is the root cause of the binging in the first place. This is the psychological equivalent of living in the gray, you know, trying to get pregnant or dating, even though you aren't at an ideal weight are two of millions of examples that I've worked on with clients and to discuss the three stress responses that lock us into all or nothing being so we can't see any other choices and how to start seeing new choices. So we're going to start with the food perspective. And the best thing to do after a binge is to no longer restrict yourself after you overeat or binge. And part of the root cause of binging is restriction. And the anti-dieting people, intuitive eating people are really on the ball about this one, right? What you resist persists and comes back with a vengeance. And from a weight perspective, your body keeps on weight when you are binging and restricting. We discussed in episode two of this season why this happens in detail, but in a nutshell, both extremes, restricting calories and binging, tell the body famine is on the way. And so please keep on the weight, right? This is the first time in our evolutionary history that we've actually had more calories available to us um, than we regularly need. By not restricting, you will gradually decrease the amount and frequency of your binges and you won't be starving your body. Now, what does not restricting look like? After binges are overeating, your blood sugar is going to be very wonky and that's okay. Learning how to work with it while you are in your process will be the best thing you can do in the long term to decrease and ultimately end binging. Working with your blood sugar after a binge will go a long way in preventing the drastic mood, energy, and cravings that happen physically post-binge and set you up for the next one. And I find one of the biggest challenges in having a truce with food is most of us don't know what normal blood sugar 
feels like, right? We think only diabetics have it or some people only become alerted to it when their doctor tells them their A1C is high and they're pre-diabetic, right? But all of us go through blood sugar swings, whether this is a chronic condition, which is, is the case in type 2 diabetes, or but we all go through the swings and it's just a matter of whether it's chronic or not. Part of getting out of the restrict binge cycle is the ability to recognize how much harder it is emotionally after you binge. And not because you're mad at yourself for all you ate and probably gained, right? This is what I used to tell myself, but because your wonky blood sugar makes your mood tank and makes you exhausted. I always tell my clients to think of Charlie Brown's friend, Pigpen. I'm not sure if you all remember him or for those of you who aren't in the States, don't know if Charlie Brown was quite as popular <laughs> in, in these other in your country as it was in America, but he had this friend Pigpen. And Pigpen just wherever he went, he had this dirt surrounding him. It was kind of like a dirt cloud. And I always tell my clients, that's kind of what it feels like with carb flu, as the paleo people will call it. And recognizing that life isn't as chaotic or bad as it feels can often help us separate reality from our internal experience based on our blood sugar being out of whack. Because your blood sugar being out of whack makes you feel very obsessive, down, and sad emotionally, right? The physical affects the emotional. Many of my clients start to recognize this once they know what foods work for them. And as they start to make different choices in their story, they become more consistent with their food and feel much more grounded. They increasingly feel an inner calm and power and contentment. And they will still binge or overeat, but their binging is decreasing in terms of frequency and amounts, not all at once. And right, binging just doesn't end overnight. Yet at that time, post-binge, they can see to a much greater degree the blood sugar effect of binging and how it makes life harder for themselves, not from a weight loss perspective, but their ability to function during their day and with their sleep. Their new increasingly normal of focus, calm, and freedom is lost to feeling really down, tired, and stuck post-binge. This incentivizes them to understand the root cause of why they're binging, aka own their story. We'll briefly cover working on this, and I'll recommend other episodes and tools to help. But owning your story is another crucial element to ending the restrict binge cycle. So after knowing what foods work best for you, you will be increasingly grounded and able to apply the three to five rule, which I made up as an easy way to think of how you need to eat from three to 5 p.m. and the next three to five days post binge. And please note, even if you aren't hungry at breakfast the next day, you need to get back to what foods work for you even at breakfast. Now is not the time to stress your blood sugar more. If you think of blood sugar as a roller coaster, which it is when we aren't eating the right foods for our body, we are concerned with the degree to which we are evening out the peaks and valleys. Think of coming down from a binge like a taper process. You can't go cold turkey, which is what restricting food does. Cutting out carbs or waiting too long to eat compared to what normally works for you will keep you on dramatic hills. And in fact, often you will find between that 3 to 5 p.m. time frame, you will have more cravings until your blood sugar evens out from the binge. Support your body as it is working to recover. So from 3 to 5 p.m., if you have a carb craving, which many people will do a day after one binge or days after multiple day binges or even overeating, I recommend having a natural sugar like fruit with a healthy fat. An apple with peanut butter or banana with your favorite nut butter are great, easy choices. Or I'm sure there are great paleo snacks out there that all of us, even if we aren't paleo, can use. I personally love my friend Sharif's Power Bites. You can actually buy them in Philly at Sip and Glow and in Pittsburgh at My Goodness and the East End Co-op. And he also sells them online at eatpowerbites.com. They are amazing. And he like doesn't even know I'm saying this. In fact, I'll probably have to email him and let him know that I'm mentioning his Power Bites. But they have all natural sugars and mostly healthy fats. And they're organic, non-GMO, like all the things. I love them. And I told Carlos I wanted to eat them during labor. And he went and bought like 10 packs when I was 39 weeks pregnant. <laughs> and I ate a few of them at the start of my labor and I didn't want to eat during labor, yet those first couple powered me through unmedicated childbirth. <laughs> I also ate them in my recovery because I found the hospital portions weren't enough for me after basically not eating for 24 hours and doing the most epic workout of my life. And I just got a couple packages for my mom for her birthday and she's in love with them too. I like the almond butter and chocolate ones, but the peanut butter and chocolate are my favorite. And I'll include the link to the Power Bites in the show notes, or you could just Google eatpowerbites.com. 
but they're an amazing snack. They're so good. Okay, so back to the snack. Plus, also, if you can take a little nap, that will also help you stabilize your blood sugar as you'll often feel tired or almost like an oncoming exhaustion as your blood sugar is restabilizing. But most of my clients can't take a nap during that time. But if you're self-employed or work from home, you might be able to. And if you can't take a nap, I definitely recommend getting to bed early as that will help stabilize blood sugar and make us less sensitive to sweets. Or try to take a cat nap when you get home. Many of us will have a bad night's sleep from binging. As if binging weren't a vicious cycle of its own, research shows that sleep deprivation affects the brain's motivation and reward circuits and can spark a desire for tasty foods and make us feel less full after eating and metabolize the fat from food in different ways. So please know sleep is so important here. I would tell my binging tired self of, I guess it's been 17 years now, don't try to get to the gym to burn off those calories. You'll have more results either doing some yoga to help you sleep or going to bed early. Now, also on days three to five post binge, you will probably feel again what paleo folks call carb flu the most. Just because processed sugar is legal doesn't mean it doesn't affect us like other drugs or alcohol, right? Let's not let the government decide <laughs> what is legal and moral, right? And what is not, because we all know it's all about what makes the most money not what's uh, the most detrimental. So it might not be as dramatic a tapering process as drugs or alcohol, yet it still happens to a degree that warrants attention. So you will have more withdrawal symptoms around days three to five. You might feel particularly emotional, exhausted, or have intense cravings. Do not push through them. Recognize the irritation and sadness and support your blood sugar again with an extra stabilizing snack if you need it, gentle movement like yoga or a walk, which can also stabilize blood sugar and sleep. Or for many of my clients, they discover they need a complex carbohydrate like quinoa or sweet potato at lunch as a baseline. <laughs> and this is the time to keep that in your diet. Don't cut back on those carbs as they will set you up for more cravings later. So from a food perspective, ending the restrict binge cycle starts with knowing what foods work best for you and how to eat at your meal so you can create a larger discrepancy and how good you can feel and how binging tanks your blood sugar and how much harder life and sleep are, not from a now I'm behind in my weight loss perspective. And then you will have to taper off the refined carbs. So follow the three to five rule. Adding in a healthy snack of a complex carb like a fruit plus nut butter or a snack like Power Bites that uses gluten-free rolled oats and maple syrup with nut butter between three to five if you have a carb craving and expect some dramatic carb flu symptoms three to five days after binging ended and plan for some gentle snacks, movement, and rest to restore your blood sugar balance effectively, right? This is the opposite of restricting yourself on all levels. It's being gentle with yourself. Don't restrict your compassion. Don't restrict your rest. This is what you need at this time. And don't restrict your food. But food is just a metaphor, right, for different layers. And so we are going to go a little bit deeper because that's what we do on this podcast. Now, I said there were three root causes, right? Restriction is one of them of food and balancing our blood sugar. And the last is our story. And this is where I think addressing our story work is critical and more important than the food. Because many will, people will be so afraid to not restrict because of the fear of continual weight gain, because of how long it could take to stop binging just from not restricting alone. And for some people, binging won't stop without addressing the other root cause of binging that isn't deregulated blood sugar or restriction but which is our story. Now we're going to take a break from a word from our sponsor, and then we'll be right back with how to address the restriction our story creates. Do you want to get to the root cause of why you fight food and struggle with your weight? Do you want to figure out what foods work best for you and rewrite the story that causes you to fall off track with your eating? Do you want to feel in control of food with more freedom and fewer rules? If so, my annual flagship Choose With Food program is tailor-made for you. In this boutique, small group experience, you have the best of both worlds. My individualized attention and the accelerated learning curve that comes from growing and learning with others. So you can put yourself on a track to a sustainable, healthy weight for you. To learn more, including hearing client stories and why they consider this program life-saving and life-changing, visit alishapiro.com backslash truce with food. And for our 2020 group, use the coupon code EARLYBIRD 
to save $500 if you register by Monday, February 17th. Registration opens Monday, February 10th. Hope to see as many insatiable listeners there. Okay, so how our story affects the restrict binge cycle is that our story, which activates our fight or flight nervous system branch, creates all or nothing thinking. When we feel under threat or are in an unconscious defensive position, and episode four of this season, Redefine Self-Acceptance, explains this more, there is no time for discernment. We must react. Or we react automatically without knowing we have no time for another choice. Yet the catch is we are often not under threat or wrong, and so have time to live in the gray and choose to respond in a way that is nourishing, the opposite of emotional restriction for us. We can often easily see the all or nothing thinking in our eating. We have rigid ideas of good and bad foods, so we are either all good or bad or being totally bad. If we eat more than we thought we should, chuck it, F it, diet starts tomorrow. Or I'm traveling for work and we'll get back to being healthy once I'm not traveling, or it's the holidays. What we are doing here is being all or nothing by being all in when life is magically perfect or under control, or nothing when real life or chaos hits. And we do this because we are all or nothing with areas of our lives that are intense and or we feel vulnerable or inexperienced in. This is just what real life is, which is why we call it real life. And it's important to recognize that this isn't just all or nothing thinking. It is literally a way of being where, yes, it's how you frame it for my cognitive behavior or CBT folks, but it's also how that controls our behavior and then how we evaluate the choice. So this is much more than reframing our thinking and feelings. This is looking at how we frame, behave, and then judge our choices. That's where the story comes in, the meaning we're making from our choices. We aren't just compartmentalizing our food as good or bad. We see and view our choices in life as good and bad. We might not think, oh, I'm being bad the same way we think with my, our food, but we may think, this will get me ahead, or don't rock the boat, or I feel guilty saying no. There's two choices, good or bad, all or nothing, or black and white is also how many of my clients refer to it as. And it can be challenging to see this binary way of being because it's been normalized for so long. And the only thing you can recognize is you're at your fridge in the evening and don't want to be. I have many clients who tell me they're all or nothing in everything, and so they can see the parallel, yeah, can't see how to get out of the cycle. I also have some clients tell me they don't binge in reaction to feeling bad. Yet when I ask them when their lifelong sweet tooth turned into binging, there was a loss of identity brought up by trauma. Maybe they was no longer able to be an athlete or work out from an injury, or they went through a really bad breakup or had an abusive boss, or they're an abusive boss to themselves, or their family always had a lot of chaos and looks were emphasized. So it feels like our body is what's wrong when really... That was what we were conscious of at the time that appeared to be what we could control. This shows up today as the phenomenon of, I know I'm a catch yet I only date when I'm thin, or I know I'm good at what I do, so why am I not going after my dream clients or dream opportunity? In all these scenarios, there's a story and we are wrong. And so we have three psychological stress responses that try and make us, quote, right. What happens when we are in our story Our SENS, social engagement nervous system, and or our fight or flight nervous system gets activated. And again, episode two from this season can give you much more details on this, but this is kind of building. (laughs) And we default to we are physically wrong because of our weight and or psychologically wrong and that we are too much or not enough, right? The weight is a metaphor for taking up too much space. In our heads or unconsciously, we hear an inner protector that doesn't want to look maybe too high maintenance or lazy or selfish or whatever we were told was bad in our families, churches, high school, etc. And so three different stress responses are activated depending on what worked for us in the past. And the three stress responses are compete, avoid, or accommodate. And if you are a lifelong insatiable listener, you've heard me bring these up before. So you'll hopefully get some more insight if you've been working with this high-level overview. And if you're new, welcome to the three stress responses we talk a lot about. (laughs) 
So a high level overview of these responses. The first is the compete response. And the all or nothing frame is, am I ahead or behind or am I winning or losing? And we often evaluate this by comparing ourselves to other women's bodies or our former thinner selves. As one of my clients pointed out in a session, beauty was the only area the patriarchy lets women compete in. It benefited the patriarchy. And now that women are in the workforce, our systems encourage competition there because it ultimately benefits the ownership class of capitalism. When we perceive we are winning with our weight, it's all good, right? Everything's good. If skinny is winning, we date, we take more creative risks, we keep up with exercise because we feel so good. Often in part, the quote, feeling good is from the idea that we are winning, even if the way we are eating leaves us hungry and will set us back in the long run. And when we are losing or behind with our calories or weight loss goals, we can spiral and our confidence in areas we are less, quote, successful in seem to disappear. We end up binging in reaction to the tension from, say, our career. Because we believe from a young age we weren't going to be the thin one, we will compete to be the smartest, most successful one. Yet the way we are competing is detrimental. We're throwing our bodies under the bus, even though taking care of our bodies can support our career or life success. We think either I'm successful with my career or my health, or what we are competing to win at, like the next job title or best mom, isn't very fulfilling. To use a very competitor frame, we think our body is a liability instead of how our health can be an asset and improve our careers and relationships. It makes us more capable in leadership and creativity. And again, creativity for a lot of my clients isn't what we think of as creativity in terms of like, you know, scrapbooking or that could be an example, but more I'm talking about strategic thinking and leading their teams and project management and stuff like that. There's a huge creative element there. Healing this pattern means identifying our own unique metrics of success and impact, including what healing steps we have to take along the way with our own bodies, right? Oftentimes, oh, we see what worked for someone else. And if we feel like they're winning, we may feel like, oh, I got to do that too, rather than being grounded in a framework of what will work for us. And sometimes you do have to experiment, which is what's tricky about this, right? It's not all or nothing. The avoid pattern, the avoid stress response from moving on from the competitor creates the all or nothing frame of fantasy failure. Our behaviors here include procrastinating, not speaking up or plain avoiding. When we avoid or chuck it, F it, as referred to it in my work, we do a plan perfectly because it's the silver bullet until we realize it isn't or we think, what's the point? And then do nothing and nothing changes. We avoid in our lives when we don't want to rock the boat or think something is harder than it is, metaphorically supersizing whatever we are avoiding because we build up what we have to do as either going to be a wild success or a devastating failure or instant approval or rejection, right? And it is often neither. (laughs) Some of my clients find themselves binging after a big presentation as a way to release how much pressure they brought to how they executed the presentation often avoiding it until the last minute and cramming and eating to power through the stress because they build it up so much in their minds. They supersize the effort because they avoid getting the clarity they needed to right-size the importance and effort required. And they usually took on more than they needed to do. I remember when I was in the early days of my business, how often I supersized so much of the business aspect because I really thought helping people was a business plan (laughs) and the universe laughed. (laughs) In a nutshell, I didn't have any understanding of how entrepreneurship worked. In one example of this, I was focusing on public relations because it was free in terms of money and I was spending all my money to go to grad school at the time. I had come from a PR background, but when you are marketing yourself versus someone else, it is so different. In my mind, I had to have my site perfect and the pitches perfect, so I avoided really understanding how PR works from a consumer standpoint. All my PR experience had been business to business, which is very different. I eventually got an opportunity through a writer a friend had connected me to. And note, this was not from my site or my pitch, which I was avoiding (laughs) and trying to do perfectly. The night before the feature was going to run, I was eating the power through going over my entire site again and making sure the cart would work. This was the very early days of e-commerce. I didn't ask for help because I assumed it was a big ask of a tech trend because in my mind, tech is always overcomplicated. The piece ran. I ended up being one small part of it and I didn't get one sale. I remember stress eating in the run up to it and then concluding what a failure that was. And all the time and energy spent felt like a double loss because I was in grad school and felt already maxed out on time and energy. 
When we are in these three stress responses of compete, avoid, and accommodate, there's a real sense of scarcity, which we will discuss in episode six. I remember thinking, what did I do wrong? And feeling it was about me rather than realizing in business to be successful, you can't look at anything as a wild success or failure or about you. It's about learning each time. But the success failure frame made me avoid all over the place. The lens was fractated all over the situation. It would take me years until I was with other women business owners to learn that they had the same experience and that PR is often about building credibility, not a sales driver. But at the time, I had taken the fantasy success devastating failure frame to supersize my effort and then evaluated the outcome through that same all or nothing thinking, which in this case was failure rather than being able to see this was not about me, but rather learning how PR and business worked. This middle place we call the muddle in Truce with Food, where we are learning and can feel really messy. And it activates our story. So if we feel like we're inherently wrong or there's shame, it just feels like pouring salt on a wound rather than recognizing the context. And we are really a small part of it. (laughs) Not who we are, but I mean, our behaviors and, and our understanding is a small part of it. It's so important to have someone who can help you see what you can learn in these situations so you can ultimately be successful in your goals. And the last stress response is accommodate. The all or nothing frame we bring here is an either or view of things. Our behaviors here are yes when we mean no or not even checking in with ourselves about what we need, right? Or thinking, oh, I don't have a preference. (laughs) That's sometimes what our inner protector tells us. This can be with food, either I eat like everyone else or I'll be the odd person out. And this is also why many people end up last on their list. It's a protective behavior because people pleasing protected us in a lot of ways. Not only does people pleasing leave little time for grocery shopping and cooking, it also leads to eating when we feel guilty, when we didn't people please enough, or we potentially disappointed people with our choices. A client told me I could share this example that happened to her over the holidays. They were traveling, and we were talking car, plane, and train. She said in the past she would go into full martyr mode and eat crappy food, which would then lead to irritation, in part caused by the food she ate. She was really noticing on this trip how amazing blood sugar control (laughs) works and how your cravings just kind of disappear when you have that, your physical cravings. In our work, she realized that she didn't need so much to plan for her kids. She was accommodating their perceived needs, which we all do, which is usually a lot more work for us, some of which can go unappreciated by others because they don't value it because they don't need it. And she shared that she was cleaning up the fridge before they left. And with what was left, she knew how to balance her blood sugar so she wouldn't be hungry. She brought a leftover chicken breast in her bag. When they were traveling, her whole family ate hot dogs and she actually ate the chicken breast. I think we've all had that where we might actually pack something healthy and then feel this urge not to eat it. She was able to identify that for her as she said, normally I would have ordered a hot dog because the feeling of being different or weird or whatever was too uncomfortable but it was fine. And then the remaining two hours in the car, I didn't crave junk food like I usually do. Her belonging to her family didn't rest on eating hot dogs. She was accommodating in the past because of all or nothing, or in this case, either I eat with them and part of the group or I eat differently and in different thinking. And how alone does that feel when you're with your own family, right? This time she realized there are lots of belonging opportunities on the trip that didn't have to do with food. And I want to emphasize that that feeling, when you own your story, the feeling of uncomfortableness, the more you realize it's safe to not accommodate or avoid or compete, the more that feeling diminishes and it just becomes automatic. I use this example because a lot of my clients with kids feel like they have to accommodate the general they when out with their kids. And that stress alone can drive them to eat when things don't go as planned, which is often. When we realize we are often accommodating and assume need of others or that everyone's needs can be met, we can get out of either or accommodating. And I want to put an asterisk here since we were talking about seeing in shades of gray. Sometimes food, especially at holiday time or birthdays, can really be a source of belonging, of connecting us to tradition. And that's fine. The important thing is you're eating what you're eating because you want to, and it's truly connecting you versus you feeling disconnected from yourself because you didn't really want that particular food and felt obligated. Whatever worked early on in our lives, compete, avoid, or accommodate to either belong or protect us from how others defined or, quote, called us out is how it felt like at the time. But if we are binging or overeating, these responses are being overused and blocking us from what we most want in life to feel successful and good on our own terms, right? That's freedom. I kind of think all humans want value freedom. 
because that's the foundation and impetus for self-expression, right? When we have clearly defined our values and live our life from there, instead of reacting to others' real or perceived needs, we feel free, not burned out. Our real lives have an element of magic and fun, and we find meaning in our pursuits, not just pleasing others. And I want to note that I've adapted these from the Thomas Kilman conflict model. This is a model that is used in workplaces, often industrial psychology, to help teams function better. But the model identifies two dimensions when choosing a course of action in a conflict situation. These are assertiveness and cooperativeness. Assertiveness is the degree to which you try to satisfy your own needs. Cooperativeness is the degree to which you try to satisfy the other person's concerns. Most of the time when we are eating out of alignment with our goals, we are too heavy on the cooperativeness and not enough of assertiveness. Because even in the assertiveness, we are often gunning for success. And I put gunning, you know, in quotes because America loves their violent metaphors. (laughs) So we are often gunning for success metrics we inherited from our families or society, not necessarily what will make us happy. And remember, conflict assumes something is wrong. Yet when we are in our stories, we assume we are wrong, which creates shame and these seemingly contradictory sides of ourselves where we can be really confident and also not in different ways. So these three stress responses put us in all or nothing black and white thinking in different ways and different behaviors or lack of behaviors. And I find that's the biggest blind spot. We don't even know what other ways to behave to get (laughs) out of this So for more details on this, and I have a few resources I'll include in the show notes, but they include a comfort eating style quiz at alishpiro.com backslash comfort hyphen eating hyphen style hyphen quiz. And even the questions alone can help you start to see how you're competing, avoiding, or accommodating in your food. And then when you take that quiz, the day after you take the quiz, you get a secret podcast episode that gets you into the nitty gritty of these responses so you can better identify and choose new behaviors. And also season two, episode two of the podcast, Freedom from the Downward Spiral, can help you understand where these stress responses come. We have an emotion, we have a story attached to that emotion, which we call a feeling, then we have a stress response, and then we have behaviors. And that episode goes over each one of those, goes through that process in more detail. So how do we break free from the all or nothing being, right? Now that we know what creates it, which are these stress responses, it generates the frame that we're thinking of and how we're thinking about things. We're not looking so much at what we're looking at, but how we're thinking about it. So first, it's really important to realize you aren't all or nothing with all or nothing, right? (laughs) Most of us have areas in our lives where we can be moderate. Most of us at the very least can be moderate with vegetables, right? (laughs) Or in areas where we have a lot of experience and where we can be discerning. These areas we feel safe in and the safety comes from a lack of all or nothing or ability to be moderate because we feel confident in our learning curve. It's important to recognize that we can get great results when we sink into the learning process or growth mindset as Dr. Carol Dweck calls it. When we grow to appreciate our effort as much as the outcome. Or as I like to think about it, because I have a high competitor streak in me, pacing ourselves. Many of my clients realize they have a growth mindset in areas, again, they feel confident in, their work, their ideas, or their relationships. It's shocking for them to see how they don't have it in areas that have been historically vulnerable, like dating or their bodies. And this is natural because there's no standard formula for success when it comes to wonderful relationships or our bodies. We need a growth mindset the most here, and it's also where it's the most challenging. Second, realize these patterns aren't bad or good. That's all or nothing thinking. (laughs) All or nothing thinking is really like a hall of mirrors. These stress responses still have a place today. I often accommodate where other people want to eat. At this point in my life, food is not that important to me beyond maintaining my health. But at the beginning of my journey, it was really important for me when I still felt like I was depriving myself if I wasn't eating what I was eating for me to pick a restaurant and feel like there were choices I really wanted there. But again, I'm at a different place in my journey. So I don't care what we eat. Food just isn't a big deal because I know how to order off the menu to keep my blood sugar balanced at a minimum. And I no longer feel like each meal needs to be like super healthy or not because I understand, I just understand how my body works so much more and health works as well, right? And sometimes avoiding can save you energy and time, right? Sometimes it's just not worth it. 
And if we're truly competing with ourselves and our own metrics of success, that can be fine as long as you aren't throwing your body under the bus consistently. In other words, sometimes you have to place your to-do list ahead of getting to the gym or skip a few extra hours of sleep. Or for some of my clients who travel, right? There's certain ways that they can make traveling easier and there's certain ways it's just going to be grueling. And then they have to recharge even more when they're not. The point is this is the exception, not the rule. Third, you want to start with one place where you have all or nothing or rigid thinking and can't see anything aside from two extreme choices and outcomes. Kind of those, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't, right? Do you have rigid ideas of what exercise counts and doesn't count? Or you can only recognize being really productive at the beginning of the day and exhausted at the fridge at the end of the day. All or nothing being shows up in many ways. And then again, being isn't only how we are thinking and feeling, feeling and also how we evaluate the outcome of our choices. If you have trouble recognizing where you are all or nothing and are binging or overeating, look to the area of your life that consumes most of your energy outside of food. That's a really good place to look. So once you identify this area where you're being all or nothing, identify the stress response that's making you think and feel that way. Are you competing, avoiding, or accommodating? We use all the different responses. And this is important. These are patterns, not fixed personality traits. Having language to identify what is happening is half the healing. And focus on one area and one stress response at a time. Don't be all or nothing with this. Clients will work on one pattern and get a ton of success. And then when they have enough distance, they will see another response now. And they have much more distance and discernment with. (laughs) It's like a body of water gets cleaner and clearer. It's easier to see the jellyfish. And God, I have been stung by a jellyfish at Hilton Head Island in August. I can't even remember the year, but it was painful. And I had a scar on my leg for like years. But we get better at seeing those rather than getting stung. (laughs) With these four keys, you can have new awareness. And then the fifth step, if we were to pretend this is linear, which it is not linear, will be to choose differently or option C, as we call it in truce with food. And it will be different based on the response. When we are competing, the long-term opportunity is the work to figure out what metrics will actually bring the success you want so you can enjoy the journey, not just the end destination. And this includes both feeling great in our body and our lives. So on a daily level, you can experiment with how to enjoy exercise instead of just accomplishing workouts because they help you get ahead with your calories. Or with career goals, can you give yourself more time and space so you can enjoy the creative process? Competitors usually underestimate how long things take and then perceive they are behind and then burn out, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of actually falling behind. One client worked on giving herself more travel time, and it seriously changed her life along with her eating. The whole background feeling, which we often talk about in Truths with Food and what our stories create, her whole background sense of traveling just eased up and it just wasn't something she dreaded and she was able to actually find healthy food choices because she realized she did have the time. It was a wonderful inter- pattern interruption. Or what values make you happy versus what you thought would make you happy and how can you start to test what success feels like in your body instead of just your head? One bottom line question with competing, what choice enables me to be replenished instead of getting ahead or not falling behind? This will create daily and long-term impact in your own unique way. When we are avoiding, the long-term opportunity is to realize there's no perfect solution and life can be much richer and magical outside of our ideas of perfection. That what we think of as imperfection or setbacks actually contain the seeds of creativity and learning for a road less travel that offers an adventure you didn't know you were missing. I think of my infertility journey. I avoided looking at my fertility for over a dozen years, in part because of my naivete, right? And partly because I knew it was going to be a pain in the ass. And it was. And I'm so glad I broke down my infertility diagnosis into steps to not only get pregnant on my own, but the learning and healing I gained have profoundly altered how I view health and healing, mainly the importance of less intervention. It determined how I pick my providers like midwives over an OB, how I approach my pregnancy, labor, birth, and Essa's health choices, i.e. less intervention with him, not more. And I have a thyroid now in great working order and in a deeper understanding of healing beyond functional medicine and a better understanding of its limitations. Check out season nine, episode three for more information on the limits of functional medicine. As Frau said in Let Go, 
we can surprise ourselves with how much beauty we can create in the breakdown. It's not a given if we continue to avoid. And when we stop avoiding, we realize we can handle discomfort. The important thing when avoiding is to get started. This is why many techniques for procrastination hacking, including setting a timer for and committing to just five minutes to do dreaded task in most cases, you'll go beyond the five minutes, but this limited commitment makes it the hardest part, getting started manageable. I'll also say though, a lot of procrastination hacking doesn't work because people don't understand it's a protective response. <laughs> because of the buildup. So again, shades of gray. We can all take something away from something, but many of these hacking things don't get to the root. Okay. So one bottom line question when avoiding, how am I supersizing my effort and outcome? I.e. this won't be a wild success or failure, acceptance or rejection. And what are smaller steps that give me momentum? Next for the accommodate pattern. When we are in an accommodating pattern, the long-term opportunity is to see the win-win in meeting your needs and that of your body, others, and your dreams, and realizing that you don't have to sacrifice yourself to achieve your health or life goals or to make other people happy. On a daily basis, this starts with checking in on what you need, and it also means checking in with what others really want or need versus assuming what they need and what they want. One bottom line questioning when accommodating, where's the win-win? So in summary, the stress responses we put up to protect ourselves and our stories create all or nothing being in different ways. By identifying these patterns, we reduce emotional tensions and a sense of restriction, which makes binging go down gradually too. We get better at living in the gray and becoming more rested, creative, and fulfilled. In other words, we're not as wound up, right? A binge releases tension. (laughs) So we're reducing this tension in a different way. It's a beautiful way to get out of restricting and binging on whatever it is we are doing this with, from food to shopping to ideas of success and failure, approval or rejection. All right, for our conclusion, it's important not to restrict your food after you binge. When coming off a binge, eating what foods work for you will help you to better identify the physical effects of binging beyond the weight loss setback, like exhaustion and irritation. As you feel better and recognize what it takes to feel better, the incentive not to binge becomes about not making life harder for yourself, not a calorie or a weight loss evaluation. Noting the three to five rule is also key. You probably need some complex carbs plus a fat snack between 3 to 5 p.m. if cravings hit, and on days 3 to 5, the day and number of days will be different for everyone, to properly taper from a binge. Be gentle as your body's going through a physical withdrawing process from all the processed carbs leaving your body and your blood sugar leveling out. Binging isn't only caused by restriction. It's also a symptom of our stories being very active. When in our stories, we have stress responses that create all or nothing being. When we are all or nothing, we binge to release the tension from competing, avoiding, or accommodating. And this won't necessarily feel bad, but we will feel restricted in our lives, which is why we can feel like we are intuitively eating, but still feel a sense of restriction. We project it onto our food, but it goes much deeper in how we are showing up in the world, right? Food is a metaphor for nourishment, and that goes layers deep. (laughs) It can go as low as you want to go so that you can root to rise as high as you want to rise. By identifying these patterns, we can learn how to be in the gray and get even better results there as we define success and fulfillment on our own terms and discover our own unique path to emotional fulfillment and success to create a life on our own unique terms. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I'll see you next week for how to end the guilt. (laughs) Episode six will be next week. health rebels for tuning in today have a reaction question or want the transcript from today's episode find me at ali shapiro.com i'd love if you leave a review on apple podcast and tell your friends and family about insatiable it helps us grow our community and share a new way of approaching health in our bodies thanks for engaging in a different kind of conversation and remember always your body truths are unique profound real and liberating.